So our first uh, first panel for this this morning is a, a great uh, women in IP panel um, speaking to diversity issues amongst other things, and I I have the great pleasure to be able to introduce um, the panel's moderator, uh, Michelle Connors. Uh, Michelle is uh, assistant uh, senior assistant, excuse me, uh, general counsel at. Uh, at Cirrus Logic here in Austin. She is a, uh, where there she's responsible for negotiating and drafting co commercial agreements. She drives strategy in a variety of areas, including the, 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 uh, the company's ESG programs. She also oversees the uh, employmental activities of, of Cirrus. Michelle uh, uh, has her BS and BA in uh, from Washington Lee University, where she graduated summa cum laude, and she graduated also from uh, the Stanford Law School prior to uh, her her um, time at, at at Cirrus. She practiced litigation both in in Silicon Valley and here in Austin. And prior to uh, between those two endeavors, she was uh, at Dell, and many of you know her from her activities here here in Austin. With that, let me let me bring up uh, Michelle and her panel. I think, Michelle, you're going to introduce your people. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for the great introduction, David. Um, Happy to have you all here with this great group of women. I am excited to call them friends and hope that you all have a chance and encourage you to talk to them later and get a chance to meet them. Um, I'm gonna keep their bios really short here so that we can have a good discussion. Um, definitely invite you all to ask questions if you have them. I think this is one of those topics that is um, you know, much better with more input and lots of brainstorming ideas for what, what the best uh, potential solution might be for your particular company. Um, so joining me on the panel here today is Christine Pompa. She is VP Associate General Counsel with Yeti. She's been there for four years and she is currently the founding co-chair um, of the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council and lead for the Asian Pacific Islander Employee Affinity Group. So welcome, Christine. Thank you. Uh, Lauren Hoffer is IP Litigation Senior Counsel for Dell, where she started in 2011. And she is the, her DEI role is the Communications Chair for the Legal DEI Committee. Uh, Sharmini Green is Associate General Counsel with Intel. She's been there for 20 years. Um, and currently, she's had a lot of roles in the DEI world, but is the DNI lead for the outside counsel program at Intel. Thank you. And Danielle Coleman is director and assistant general counsel for global litigation at VMware. She's been there about four and a half years. She is the co-lead of the Legal Career Growth Initiative and global thought leadership chair for the Black at VMware group. So thank you all for being here today. I'm really excited for the discussion. Um, you'll note that the written materials that were provided in advance had some pretty grim statistics. So I'm not gonna focus on any of that because I don't want this to be a depressing um, kind of morning. So the plan is to focus on specific concrete actions that you and your company can take. Um, we're gonna try to give you some thoughts and ideas, um, appreciate your input as well so that this can really be a conversation. Um, like I said, we'll have the opportunity for audience questions, so don't be shy. Um, otherwise, I think these ladies can have a great discussion. So I'm gonna start with Lauren. Um, you know, everybody, obviously diversity and inclusion is the right thing to do, um, but can you talk a little bit about you know, some real business reasons as to why we should remember this is important? So I am a trial lawyer, and I have a very firm belief that diversity of your team really helps you with the jury. And this started when I was a very young lawyer. I did an externship um, prosecuting traffic court, and I was there for three months, and the jury panels had to stay. I, you would do about six trials a day, 
and the jury panel had to stay all day and it would get recycled into every jury. Um, and at the end of one day, one of the jurists gave me a hug and said, you remind me of my daughter, um, which I clearly was a huge win. It made me feel great, but it also made me realize that I wouldn't have reminded her of her daughter if I wasn't a female. Um, and having a diverse panel helps, a diverse team helps the jury relate to someone on your team. Um, having people up there that the jury can relate to helps some, you know, not everybody is going to remind her of her daughter, but if someone reminds them of their son or any part of people that they like, that is helpful for you to win. And as litigators, obviously, we want to win. Um, so that, I have a very firm belief that a diverse team, particularly on a jury, and a jury trial helps you win. Um, for that, for lots of reasons, um, obviously diversity of ideas and making sure that those perspectives are brought in um, to, to relate to the jury, um, also very helpful, um, but definitely want to see diversity on the teams to get those ideas in as the case is being built so that when you're building your case, the entire litigation, you're getting to the, to the end goal that helps people relate to your case because you've had that diversity throughout the entire litigation. Yeah, love it. Thank you so much. And Charmini, you know, we always talk a lot about diversity at these types of conferences. I think in part because it's one of the easiest things to measure. Um, you can have statistics and metrics about that. But inclusion is also very important and inclusivity. It's a lot harder to, you know, nail down as something concrete. So what has Intel been doing to work on inclusivity? Yeah, um, so when we started um, our diversity program, it was literally called the diversity program. Um, and I, I think we realized pretty quickly that uh, there needed to be another component to it. And that's where the inclusivity piece came in. Um, and I think over the last six, seven years that I can recall, we've worked very hard uh, to include different groups. And it's not just um, male, female, racial, uh, you know, inclusivity, but also uh, disabilities, um, LGBTQ community. Uh, and they're harder to measure, like you said. Um, and it's also, if you look at it, a lot of those are self-reporting, um, you know, disabilities especially. Um, and, um, you know, but we've gone through um, a lot, taken a lot of effort to try and make sure we include everyone. There's a program at Intel that we're um, disseminating more broadly now. It's called an inclusive leadership program. Uh, it's open to everyone, not just uh, managers, the idea being you can all lead. Um, and it's uh, largely geared towards um, understanding your coworkers and, and enabling people to show up at work as themselves um, and, you know, to learn how to embrace differences and, and build teams that have truly diverse backgrounds and, and experiences. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Definitely, it's another one of those kind of business imperatives where everybody would like their team to be better. And this is one of the tools in the toolkit to be able to help us all get there. Um, I was going to go through, I think each of the women has a really unique and different story. They're all at, you know, their companies are at different levels of maturity, certainly different sizes. Um, so hopefully among their stories, you might hear something that would work for your company and your team um, and take some ideas away from that. Um, Christine, I'll start with you at Yeti. Um, I know you were one of the co-founders of the diversity, equity, and inclusion um, group there and movement there. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how that effort started and kind sure. of what what provoked that. Sure. So so Yeti is still pretty a, a pretty young company. Um, we started in 2006 with probably a handful of employees. And the company didn't really start to take off until about 2011. Um, today we have a little over a thousand employees in several countries. Um, and Yeti had some informal DE&I initiatives when I joined in 2018, but it really wasn't until 2020 where the company decided that it wanted to formalize um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion program. Um, and a lot of that was due to the multitude of events 
that occurred in 2020. There was just a strong desire from employees that Yeti have a more formal program and voice a more formal commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the executive leadership team asked me to serve as the co-chair for Yeti's first DE&I council. And our CEO was very clear. Um, he didn't want Yeti's actions in this area to be merely performative. And he wanted whatever we put together to have a sustaining and meaningful impact. Um, so we did a lot of thinking about that. And you know, over my career at the various companies that I've worked for, there's often a gap between companies' good intentions and what they say, and then actions that actually have meaningful impact. So we took a lot of time to think about, you know, where, where can Yeti have an outsized impact in diversity, equity, inclusion? And being an outdoor brand and one of the leading outdoor brands in the country, we, we decided, well, first, let's, let's make a, a strong impact on the people within our walls. So all of the people at Yeti, we call ourselves Yetizens, which is <laughs> still funny for me to say. Um, and then the outdoor industry. You know, the outdoor industry has a lot of barriers, um, access barriers for people of color, for people with disabilities. And we firmly believe that the outdoors is for everyone. And so, you know, instead of focusing on all the various social justice issues that everybody cares about, like where can a company the size and type like Yeti where can we make the biggest impact? So that was kind of our, our founding principles. Um, and you know, one of the things that we started doing, because this was a whole new thing for Yeti, and we're only two years into it, um, we decided to focus on training and initiatives that will affect Yetizens. And we didn't want to put forth a strategy that was just dictated from the top. Um, and so we started by hosting what we called listening sessions, where we had um, somebody who would anonymously meet with various groups of people within the company, um, groups of Asian American employees, African American employees, um, employees with disabilities, um, the LGBTQ plus community, the Latino, Latina community. Um, and we, we had very frank, honest, um, vulnerable discussions with each of these groups. Um, it was all anonymous. People's comments weren't identified. People's identities weren't written down. And what we ended up doing was sharing themes from each group with the executive leadership team. And based on that information that we collected from employees from all across the company at all levels, we, um, we thought we put together our action plan and our first the first thing that we decided to do was start these employee affinity groups. Some companies call them employee resource groups. And really what they were was just groups for people with some commonality and their allies to have a space to be comfortable, to be vulnerable, to support each other, um, and just basically to provide support. Um, so that was uh, our first action. And then we also, you know, on the second prong of our strategy, making sure the wild and the outdoors is available to everyone, we continue to strengthen relationships with the community. So, you know, there are a number of organizations in Central Texas that focus on getting minority people outdoors and having them feel comfortable and welcome and safe um, outdoors. And so that's, that's been a lot of work and there's been a lot of engagement um, across the entire company. Um, and then the DEI Council, which is kind of like this overarching organization um, within Yeti, we kind of focus more on um, looking at the existing systems and processes that affect all of the employees at Yeti and looking at how some of these systems could potentially impact people differently. And whether, and without us even knowing it. So, you know, looking at our hiring process, our interviewing process, the review process, promotions, and all of that, and looking at things from a more holistic level um, so that we make sure that, you know, our culture and our processes are equitable and inclusive. So, can you tell me a little bit about who's part of that council sure. and, and kind of legal's unique role to that aspect? Sure. So, um, legal doesn't have a, a unique role yet. 
um, other than my participation. <laughs> um, but the council is basically made up of, of people at the leadership level um, across all functions of the business. So it's a small group of people. Um, it's a very diverse group. Um, and we were basically appointed by, you know, somebody from the executive team. So each person on the executive team appointed somebody from their group to serve on the council. Okay, very cool. Yeah. Um, and I know you've had some, I mean, it's a young program, still maturing, but you've had some level of success already that's been measurable kind of in your talent realm. Do you want to Absolutely. share some wins? Yes. Yeah. I mean, when I started at Yeti, our R&D team, our engineering team, there was, there were no women and there were no engineers or designers of color. There was, it was very um, homogeneous. Um, and our leadership team was also um, very, not very diverse, but in the last, just in the last two years since I've joined, um, our leadership team is now 50% female. Um, we've increased uh, cultural, ethnic, racial diversity by 13 or 15%. Um, including in our um, in our innovation department. Um, one of the other things that I consider a success is that we've been able to implement these employee affinity groups and integrate them into various functions of the business. So for example, you know, Yeti, Yeti's a product company and a marketing company, and we run a ton of marketing campaigns. I'm sure you probably all get the emails. <laughs> um, whenever we run one of those campaigns, you know, we we may have one of the employee affinity groups review those just to make sure that they're not, we're not saying something or depicting something that could be offensive, that could be sensitive. You know, sometimes, you know, we name products, sometimes companies borrow from other languages. We want to make sure that, um, you know, what we're, what, we're, what we're putting in the marketplace isn't something that could create controversy. And, you know, and that, that is really appreciated by people because Everybody loves to be involved in product, and so it's kind of a nice way um, to get more people in the room. Um, we also, uh, the women's uh, uh, employee affinity group has been involved in kind of transforming the way that Yeti thinks about designing products. When I joined Yeti, they gave me the only backpack that we made at the time, and it was this massive, heavy backpack that kind of like almost touched like the back of my knees. Like it was just <laughs> the most ridiculous. And I never used it. And I felt bad that I wasn't using a Yeti backpack like everybody else. But, you know, people who, the people who designed that product, they weren't really thinking about anyone else, but, you know, Yeti's original primary demographic, which was the hunt and fish crowd. So that backpack was made for them. It wasn't made for people like me. It wasn't made for people like Michelle or anyone else on this table. So, um, you know, getting all these these groups involved to provide additional perspective in the room. And product and marketing is kind of like the obvious, you know, entry point. But when you think about sales, when you think about, you know, talent, all these different things, like everybody has some interesting perspective to share. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. I mean, just another iteration of Lauren's point that, like, this is important to your business, yes. right? Like, this will make everybody better um, improving the product along the way mm -hmm. um, and gets people excited about the company they're working for if they can feel they've got a real hand in it. Yep. So, awesome. Um, I'm going to move on to Danielle at VMware. Um, I, I thought you had a really interesting perspective and a lot of experience uh, with VMware's employee resource groups. And so maybe you could share... You know, some examples of that and, and your experiences with them. Sure. Our employee research groups have been in place for about 10 years. I've only been at VMware for four and a half years, but um, I had a chance to be the global co-lead of our Black at VMware group. We call it Power of Difference Groups. And really, they started off, I think, 10 years ago being more affinity groups focused on just community building, having fun things, celebrating Black History Month, et cetera. And now they're matured more into being business resource groups where we're supposed to be helping and support the business, advise the business on change. Uh, but another part of our role, of course, is to amplify the voices of the underrepresented communities at our company. And so one of the things I did, I started my role the, at this global um, lead of the Black and VMware group in 2020, around not too long after the time when there was the death of George Floyd, the 
um, death of Amal Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, the list goes on. And of course, a lot of, like a lot of the countries, there's a lot of social unrest, they're just thinking like, what is going on here? And so one thing we did is we held what we called a global culture club meeting. We'd already been having these smaller meetings on a regional basis where people were um, sharing their stories, having safe spaces. But we decided to have a company-wide meeting and actually went pretty viral in our company where we had over 8,000 people oh, wow. um, show up <laughs> for it or, or watch it on a playback later. And really the idea there was to um, have employees share their stories. Unfortunately, some had experienced police brutality themselves or sharing my own story that I went to segregated schools in a small town in Mississippi. And I'm not that old, I'm getting older, but <laughs> <laughs> oh this was still happening um, even in my childhood or other things. And the idea was to help bring awareness and empathy so that people would know that these aren't just isolated incidents that are happening, you know, in maybe towns that you aren't in, but your fellow employees may have experienced some instances of racism or injustice. And I think it was really impactful in, um, in that we saw, we also launched a social justice fund because again, many people were stuck at home. Um, this was also during the pandemic and people wanted to do something. And so uh, we were able to raise $500,000 to give to different social justice organizations such as Equal Justice Initiative um, by Brian Stevenson that focuses on criminal justice reform. And then we had, you know, again, the We Hear You campaign was very effective, and we saw that we had the attention of executives, managers, et cetera. And so we really wanted to make sure that we were driving different actions. So we did things like language audits, um, taking a look at, and we worked with, you know, other many other tech companies as well on language audits. I believe Intel was one of them, for example, where we just made sure that while we're using inclusive language, changing things from like white lists and black lists mm -hmm. to accept lists, deny lists, but also looking at our job announcements. Are we making sure that we have inclusive language in there? So we have tools where we put those through. We also uh, looked at our supplier diversity. Uh, for example, in legal, we already had some things in place, but double down, are we making sure that we are doing our best we can to make sure our outside counsel are diverse? Um, we also had many asks of our business. Mm -hmm. We, for example, Juneteenth became a holiday. As one of, that was one of our asks. Uh, we also said we wanted to see more leadership at the top. So we did see over some time that we have a now black board member for our company, but also more internally, we were doing an okay job at recruiting black employees or underrepresented employees at the individual contributor level, but we weren't seeing quite the same at the higher levels. And I'm happy to say now that our numbers of black VPs has more than quadrupled. Wow. The number of our director plus black employees has doubled. And I'm sure there's even more metrics and things, but those are probably ones at top of mind. So that we were able to see some real change there and people really did take a listen to us. Yeah, I love that using that, using your power when you had it, right? When the spotlight was on you, where, what can you do to really make the most of that moment um, and capitalize for the future? Um, one other thing that I thought you mentioned during our prep sessions that was really interesting to me was this concept of reverse mentoring. So I think we're all familiar now with the concepts of mentors and sponsors and the various differences among them. Um, but this is the first time I had really heard about reverse mentoring. So can you explain that to the group? Sure. And it was something I learned about too about when I started at VMware. But uh, basically reverse mentoring is where we prepare senior leaders with um, more junior folks. And so we encourage everyone from Senior Director Plus to be paired with a uh, reverse, be a reverse mentor, reverse mentor. But I think our VP Plus and most of our groups are required to do it. So basically what happens is uh, a senior leader can basically say what community they want to learn more about or be paired with, or they can say they don't care. So it could be women. So maybe they want to be paired with a woman or uh, someone from the black community. So take, for example, I am the reverse mentor to our head of worldwide sales. And so the idea is, again, creating these safe spaces where you can have those vulnerable conversations. Um, and so we meet monthly. And again, he can it's a time for him to be able to ask questions in a confidential <laughs> environment that he may not have. But it's also a chance for me to provide feedback. So he invites me to his senior leadership meetings with his VPs where they're presenting on things. And then we'll have kind of a debrief afterwards. Is there anything I saw, any suggestions I have? Or we'll also talk about things like um, now he has all of his uh, direct reports to having a DEI goals and plans. And so helping to contribute to those are just what I'm seeing in other areas of the business that are being effective and things like that. So the idea is to create these reverse mentorships where we have your senior leaders learning more about uh, their diverse communities and then implementing maybe some of those learnings in their day-to-day -day or with their teams or et cetera. Yeah, I love that. I'm 
definitely stealing that idea and suggesting it, Michael. So take a note. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the other thing, you also recently took over the career growth team for the legal department. So maybe you can talk a little bit about what you're working on or what your goals are for that program. Yeah, so my general counsel reached out to me because she is this great champion for DEI, but she wanted to do more. And how she talked about it, she had t attended a session with NCCA, and one of the speakers had, you know, really given a talk about make sure that we're not trying to fix diverse people, <laughs> <laughs> right, with different programs and things like that. So she wanted to be sensitive to uh, the fact that we had done a great job of actually recruiting diverse talent for our legal department. We're over 50 percent women, uh, over about 25 percent uh, URM um, folks there. But what can we do to make sure that we're retaining people? So that being said, a lot of the feedback we were hearing is that people did want to see more on the development front. How can they grow their career? So instead of calling it a DEI program, we called it the Legal Career Growth Initiative. And uh, one thing, like I said, was we saw that about 40%, so a study said that 40% of attrition were people saying they thought it was a lack of career and development opportunities. So we really wanted to focus on what can we do to help make sure people have those opportunities. So we do the traditional things of having people come in to give trainings, right? Uh, but we also try to do what we call an opportunity board, where we also have managers post different opportunities where people can kind of work on different teams and get those experiences and broaden their skill set. Um, we also do more career coaching. Before that was only available for senior level people to have an executive coach, but we've made it more accessible. People can have one-on-one -on -one career coaching um, to expand and learn. And then just to make sure that we're not only focusing on sort of this fixing thing, right? <laughs> that we're also thinking about, you know, it's great for diverse candidates or just everyone, right, to grow and develop. But we also have to make sure that we're doing things on the manager side of things. Are our managers making sure they're checking their biases? Are they making sure they're thinking about opportunities broadly for people on the team and not just their favorite person or the person who may look like them and things like that? So we also have, to have trainings and um, audits and things that we focus on related to that. So one example might be succession planning um, is that we've really been working on too, where leaders are thinking more about mapping out officially to who, you know, they may not, probably not going to be the job forever, right? <laughs> so who would take over and what skills does that person need? What would the steps need to help get them there? No, that's wonderful. And are those kinds of things mandatory or just in invitational? Is it just for your pods or is it open to the entire group? We actually made it open into the entire group. It did start off because it's a diversity initiative, uh, but we decided that we have a large, you know, a, a amount of diversity in our group already and that these programs were something that everyone can use. It is voluntary though, so people can opt in to do it. They don't want to, they don't have to, but we've seen a lot of participation and the uh, different opportunities. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, love it. And definitely, I feel like, again, just like with diversity and inclusion, that it's easy to sometimes focus on the metrics of diversity. The kind of inbound talent is sometimes easy to bring people in, but how do you grow your own internal leaders and make sure that, that you're retaining all the people that you worked so hard to get there in the first place and, and to help them succeed? So um, lots of good ideas. Thank you. Um, Lauren, I'm going to move to you next. Um, I know that you're the communications, on the communications chair for the legal DEI committee, and maybe you could just start by telling us what that is and, and what your role is. Well, that's a great question. Um, so we realized that our legal department didn't necessarily know what the DEI committee was doing. Um, so we now have a whole communications team making sure that the department knows what's available, they know what we're doing, they have opportunities to participate. Um, that's basically it, making sure we have a fairly large legal department and so not everyone is on the DEI committee and just giving everyone, there's plenty of opportunity to participate and making sure that people know what's happening, which obviously is both good for getting the DEI initiatives done because we have more people volunteering to do them, but also helping people feel good about where they work. So what are some of the kind of road shows that you're doing with the legal team to, to brag about and get them excited or to ask for their help? Well, so we're kind of been going through everything that we do at Dell and I can everything we do in the Dell legal department to, to help DEI and actually would get some audience participation. So our different initiatives within the DEI committee, um, we have a whole group that's working on pipeline building people, um, high school and, and law school, high school, college, and law school, that we are working with people in all of those groups to build the pipeline of diverse lawyers. And um, we've heard a lot about, we have retention committee, we have a recruitment committee into our own department, 
And then we have a committee that works on um, fostering diversity within the law firms that we hire. Is there anything particular that you guys would be more interested in hearing about? All right, well, so I'll start. <laughs> so we haven't heard that much about pipeline. Um, so one of the things that we're really proud of is that we sponsor the mock trial team at Aikens High School. Um, it is not that many people. We don't give them that much money, but we give them money to, to travel to their mock trial competitions. So we pay for the buses, we pay for their snacks, we pay for some of their meals, we pay for their hotel rooms. Um, and the Aikens mock trial team is awesome. Um, they have a whole mock trial room. They, I've, I've gone to practice with them. They are amazing. Um, and we are starting to do some follow-up to see if those kids actually are pursuing law as they go into college, um, and they are. Um, so I really feel like that is really working to help promote diversity and to get kids excited about being lawyers. And it doesn't take that much money and it doesn't take that many people to do it. So I feel like any legal department um, or any small law firm could adopt a school here in AISD would be awesome um, to help get kids and diverse people into our field. Um, so that I'm super proud of. Um, the other thing that we're doing um, at UT Law and some laws in the Northeast, because we have campuses in the Boston area and here, and we've actually just started this in Canada as well. Um, we are giving scholarships to diverse people um, in law school. Um, we, do, we give scholarships to 2Ls and 3Ls, but if you get it as a 2L, you automatically get it as a 3L. It is a $5,000 scholarship each year. Um, and um, everyone who applies for the scholarship, whether or not you get it, is offered the opportunity to have a mentor at Dell. Um, and we're actually getting a fair amount of uptake on that, um, which is great. It gives the lawyers in our department an opportunity to feel like they're helping someone. Um, and it also, I mean, it's been, it's been a really, really good program. Um, and the winners obviously also get mentors. They come in. Um, they, they've all come to some meeting that we've had to introduce themselves and tell people what they're looking for. And we've also done follow-up with them once they're in the legal profession um, to see how they're doing and what the scholarship meant to them. And definitely have said it allowed, you know, $5,000 may not seem like enough to a lot to you, but to me, that allowed me to study. That allowed, you know, that paid for my rent. That kept me from having to have a third job. Um, so that, you know, is definitely... I don't know if easy is the right way, but it is a way that you can help, you know, foster diversity coming into the legal profession and help people who might be the first person and their family to go to college to kind of get through to, to get more diverse talent into the legal field. Oh, and one other thing, um, I have not yet succeeded in getting somebody from this program into the legal department, um, but Dell has a really robust neurodiversity um, initiative. And we are partnering with ARC here in Austin um, to get people who have been diagnosed with some form of autism to come work at Dell. And I don't know if you guys knew about these programs. Um, people with neurodiversity enjoy doing things that other that's being neurodiverse. We all enjoy doing different things. Um, but we've had a lot of success in the finance area and um, in some of the more technical areas that, I mean, it's been so successful that retention is now becoming like an issue because everybody wants these people. Um, and at least in the legal department, what I've identified that would be helpful for us, things that lawyers are not good at and don't like doing, <laughs> um, billing, um, working on all the spreadsheets to deal with the billing, all of the money stuff that we all, or at least I hate. Um, people who have brains work differently than I do, they enjoy it. Um, they enjoy spreadsheets. They enjoy things like that. And it is definitely... Every, all the feedback is that it is a huge win-win. And if you are here in Austin, the ARC has this program up and running. It is in tons of tech companies and they could help you source people who might be good for those kinds of jobs in your department or law firm. Yeah, thank you for raising that because I actually wasn't familiar with that program until you mentioned it on our prep call. And I feel like neurodiversity is one of those, you know, others that we often forget about when we're talking about women or people in the black community. And, and it's such an important group and a really good resource, I think, for everybody to have. Um, I was also, I know, at least when I was at Dell, that there were a lot of great programs between in-house counsel collaborating with some of our outside counsel firms and, and working on development projects together. So maybe you could give some examples of that. 
Yes, so obviously um, the mentorship program, we have um, some of our law firms have their own interns who um, diversity internship programs. And so Dell will partner with them to, to mentor them. Um, additionally, if they are doing work, it's good for, good, good for Dell. Um, if they are doing work for their law firm and doing some project, if it's a law student or even a college student, um, they will come present to us. So they do a specific it's free work for Dell. I'm not going to pretend that it doesn't work out great for us and that they research some topic that we are interested in and then come present to us. And we've had a few of those people come to then work at the firms who will then, who very specifically remember coming, you know, how important that was to them to get to present to the client. Um, and I remember them too, because you're so pleased and typically they're answering a question I wanted to know the answer to anyway. Um, so that's been a huge success. Yeah, and you also give out awards too, right? To your outside counsel for their programs? We do, that's kind of how we encourage outside counsel um, to also have diverse teams. Like I said, I want my teams to be diverse because I think that helps us win. Um, but we do um, every year, if we've had a specific amount of spend with the law firm, they are um, asked but not required. Um, they're invited to participate in our awards program. And so we felt we're actually now collecting the DEI data. So they're not having to, we know how many, we know how diverse the team is just from it to the extent that they're allowing us to, like we, we can tell in our systems how diverse the team is that are actually billing into Dell. Um, so that data is now coming in kind of automatically. Um, but we are asking about their initiatives. What are they doing to increase the pipeline? What are they doing to, um, recruit diverse talent, um, you know, what are their percentages of their partnership ranks and their associate ranks and all of that. Um, so that's part of what we are doing to help encourage diversity. And obviously some of that talent ends up coming into Dell. So that helps us with our pipeline as well. Um, but just giving an award every year to the law firms that we are doing business with. Um, and I will say that the applications are crazy impressive, what everyone is doing. We should be proud of ourselves as a legal community because what everyone is doing, um, I think it's helping and it's all, it's all pushing and, and the applications are so impressive and it is always really hard to pick a winner. Yeah, um, thank you very much for that. And Sharmini, I know Intel is working a lot with their outside counsel programs too. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're doing specifically. Sure, um, so uh, it, we've always had, uh, or I should say in the last five to six years, have had an incentive program, um, you know, bonus program for um, the most diverse uh, law firm. Um, we do the same thing that you mentioned. We, um, it's not voluntary, we actually <laughs> require it. <laughs> we collect data um, every quarter we get, um, um, mainly billing data for ourselves, but we also collect the law firm statistics, um, you know, regardless of whether they're doing work for us. Um, and we measure that, and thankfully there's somebody from finance who likes to work on spreadsheets <laughs> who helps us with this, um, but he calculates number after number. And um, so we were giving out um, awards every year to the most diverse law firm. Um, but a couple of years ago, our general counsel looked at the numbers and was very unhappy because he felt like we weren't moving the needle enough. Um, you know, we, we were making tiny incremental um, uh, advances, I guess you could call it. Um, so he decided that we needed to do, uh, you know, so we had, it's the whole carrot and stick thing. We had the carrot, now he's like, okay, we need a stick. Um, so we actually um, rolled out what we call uh, the Intel rule to our law firms. Um, and it was a, um, it was 20, basically it is sometime in 2020, yeah, in the midst of the pandemic, we told our law firms that um, if you don't meet certain percentages, by January 1st, 2021, we won't be sending you new work. Um, and so the numbers that we used were based on different articles about averages. Um, and, you know, there were, what we could find was 21, I think it was like 20.8. So we made it 21% female equity partners and 10% underrepresented minorities. And that is the Intel rule that, you know, you have to at least meet that minimum. Um, and 
you know, he was, our general counsel was very upset at the time because he's like 21%, but 50% of law school grads are about 50% are female, you know, uh, associates in that same number. So, um, so we did uh, enforce that. And um, I, in the patent group, I, I managed outside counsel for the patent group at the time. And it's like, we cannot meet 20 one percent. There are not 21 percent female patent attorneys, so we cannot have 21 percent female equity partners. Um, so again, uh, after collecting a lot of data, we came up with 12.3 percent um, of uh, female equity partners for our patent groups. Uh, we couldn't find any different data for underrepresented minorities, so we kept it at 10. Um, and we, uh, of the firms when we started, four out of the 20 something firms that were doing work for us um, actually met the rule. Oh my uh, goodness. But <laughs> yeah, just barely. Um, but uh, by the end of the year, they all actually made the numbers. So, so you with, didn't lose anyone? Uh, we did lose some firms, but not because of their diversity numbers. We okay. were in the midst of consolidating and cutting down the number of firms we used. Um, but it, it kind of fed into each other. Right. Um, but uh, they did, and they had to get creative about it. And, you know, in, in in some cases, some firms were very regional, And but in the midst of the pandemic, people were starting to look remotely, and suddenly they were like, well, we could hire people from other states. Um, and um, so it, that's one of the things that we've done. Um, we We've also partnered with the law firms um, quite a bit to try and help them with their retention, their hiring. Um, we've done things like mock trial programs for them where we act as you know, the real life clients. Um, uh, we've had, I wanna say third, fourth year associates and maybe junior partners um, you know, do pitch meetings and, you know, we act as clients and then they get to meet our general counsel and that's, you know, a big deal because it's hard to meet Intel's general counsel. <laughs> um, and I, on that note, I will say I, I'm very excited to say, and many of you may know this, but we now have a female, a black female general counsel um, and it's our first female general counsel. Um, uh, going back to the law firms, um, yeah, we uh, we try to partner with each firm on their own programs as opposed to us trying to roll out a program for outside counsel. So, um, you know, in some cases we've got mentorship programs. We provide mentorship. Other firms don't necessarily need or want that. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I'd say that's that's mainly it. You know, that it was interesting to see how enforcing numbers, which we've, typically stayed away from actually made a difference and had an impact. Yeah, and I guess if that's something coming down from your general counsel, it's a little easier to get buy-in from that. Right. It might be harder from the ground up, but right. I guess people got on board pretty quickly. They did. <laughs> um, so you mentioned actually that it was it was harder for the patent firms, and, and right. we've all seen that some of the inventor diversity um, within you know the other employees outside of the legal department can be kind of rough sometimes um, to make sure that we're getting those good ideas and capturing input from women and people from underrepresented groups. Um, your previous role had you working, you know, directly with inventors a lot more. Can you talk about some of the things that you and Intel have been doing to try to increase the inventor diversity? How do you incentivize maybe not just patenting, but trade secrets or capturing those other ideas that can be really valuable for Intel? Sure. Um so we collected data. Intel's a very data-driven company, so everything has to come, has to come down to data. Um, and from what we could tell from the USPTO, about 16% of inventors are women. Um, and Intel's numbers were lower than that. Um, but our uh, technical women representation is actually uh, at market, so 24% women, uh, technical women. So we, um, I tried to put some programs in place to try and incentivize women. But as you all know, you, you know, with patent law, you can't make stuff up. It's, there's nothing specific <laughs> to being female that it lends itself to patenting. Uh, but I did, um, did this a few times where we collected groups of um, female inventors from different business units, brought them together, um, 
you know, put a, put um, some high level areas in front of them. Um, you know, AI, just generally speaking. So, uh, you know, but we had people there from manufacturing, uh, from software, from, you know, architecture group. Um, but it was amazing to see the different um, ideas that came out. We do this a lot with our inventors anyway. Um, and so I've been through multiple ones of these think tanks. Um, but the so, I've, you know, there's a pattern to the ideas and the, the pattern that comes out of a women's think tank was completely different. It was, um, you know, much more geared towards women's lives. You know, like, I want this to happen so that I can drop my kids off and get to work, you know, things like that. Um, so uh, we were able to do that a couple of times. Um, we also tried to include our uh, male inventors in the process, going back to inclusivity, um, you know, which, uh, and um, a couple of them did a presentation. Some of our prolific inventors uh, presented. One was, he, he's got hundreds of patents, but what we didn't know is that he gets the plaques and his office was, you know, on Zoom. It was oh like gosh. his entire <laughs> office was his patents. So, um, you know, um, so, so that was great. And uh, Intel's patent group is also somewhat unusual in that we have a third of our uh, attorneys are women and mostly in relatively senior and leadership positions. Um, so I invited all of us to be on the call. Um, so it was, and, and then we actually got our outside counsel and we decided to go all the way and we invited all of our female outside counsel to come. So, um, you know, that, that was an interesting experience and uh, the feedback that I got from the uh, people who participated is that they really appreciated the environment um, and, and to be able to speak freely. Um, that they tend to get more, and, and this is, I'm completely generalizing here, but that it's, they tend to be quieter in rooms where there are almost always, you know, like they're a lot of times the only female. Um, so I, I think that we've managed to get, get them started. Um, and, and we tried to do a mix of senior and, you know, people who've never, uh, filed a patent before. Mm -hmm. And so to try and sort of cultivate a new batch of inventors. Um, uh, we also tried to add uh, committee members. You know, when, when we get our invention disclosure, uh, they're evaluated by different committees. Um, there were committees with zero women, and uh, we tried to you know, encourage Thanks. people to go look for <laughs> uh, qualified women to be on your committees. So... Uh, yeah, that's so, awesome. Um, and I know we were talking before the session got started, um, Lauren, you mentioned there's kind of a real pay equity aspect to this. I think all of our companies have incentive programs to reward and recognize inventors and people who are making real contributions to the company. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so actually Dean and I, who's in the audience, um, we presented to, we have an, a women's, uh, women, women engineer group, and um, when we presented to them, and one of the first things I did was put up the incentive, like this is how much you make per patent. There are people here who are doing this many patents a year, they are putting their children through college based on this extra income. Hmm. Like you can make real money doing this, and it is really just part of what you're doing in your day job. You just have to recognize what's a novel idea and get it patented. Um, and then one thing we were talking about, which I um, hadn't thought through, we don't use it for our patent awards, um, we use cash, um, but one of the things that Dell does do for awards are we get points, um, like airline points, that you um, each manager has a certain amount of points they can give up, and then you can use those points to shop. Um, and it, what is so ridiculous about it, it totally works for me um, <laughs> because it feels like it's like when you use your airline miles to get and you get a free trip and you feel so good about that. When I, I used some of my points to like spend a bunch of money at the container store to reorganize my pantry and I never would have spent that much money at the container <laughs> store ever. Um, but now every time I look at my pantry, I'm like, thanks, Dell. This is awesome. <laughs> um, so it, possibly those kind of incentives could be um, more interesting um, and kind of fun as a different and maybe could add to the diversity. Um, the, the other thing that we did, and we need to do this again, um, kind of going back to the brass tacks of getting more diverse inventors, 
um, is that we offered, we do you know, patent mining session, sessions, which I'm sure every company does. We send our lawyers into groups that are doing things that are novel um, to help ferret out what they're doing that's novel and patentable. Um, and things that come out of those sessions um, typically get past the committee because they've already been vetted, vetted by the lawyers in the room. Um, and so kind of offering those to more women, saying like, hey, this is happening, and let us come and do a mining session with you so that we can understand what you're working on and understand what you're doing is new. Um, and we basically gathered emails and started doing mining sessions with some of these people, and I think that is helping us get more diverse people into the patent, getting patents. Um, yeah, no, and Charmaine, you had talked about um, even outside of the patent space. Like, I know my company sometimes faces, you know, folks working in test and validation. They might have really innovative ideas, but it's not something that we're going to publish out to everybody, um, or it's not readily detectable in a competitor. Um, so, what are ways that you might be able to recognize, like, those other programs that maybe you're keeping as a trade secret? Yeah, we came up with a designation that also has a monetary aspect to it to recognize uh, people who submit ideas in that area where it's either not detectable or we don't want to release it. Um, you know, we want them, we want to keep them as trade secrets. Um, and that helped because we did have certain groups that were extremely unhappy that, you know, they, they just never, ever qualified to get any patents. Um, so yeah, I think I think you know something that recognizes that um, you know we we appreciate the idea, the, uh, the even the novelty of it, but it's there's no value to us to file a patent, but we still value you. Right, right. Um, so kind of transitioning with that idea of rewards and recognizing people's valuable input. Um, kind of the diversity penalty has often been that people who are diverse or women are like tasked with fixing fixing the women problem, right? Or, you know, black leaders working to help everything and make sure that people are stepping up. But it's a lot of work in addition to everybody's regular day job um, to take on some of these leadership positions for employee affinity groups or, or working on these other committees. So, what are some of the things, um, I know, Danielle, you mentioned your company has a, a, a program to be able to help incentivize the, these pod leaders um, to, to step up and be recognized for the extra work they're doing. Right, right. One thing we talk, call it is the diversity tax, where a lot of times it's diverse individuals who are asked to step up and do this extra uncompensated work to uh, work on these diversity initiatives. I think many of us do it because we're passionate about it and we want to see the change. I think we've been uh, impacted by seeing change happen ourselves, right? But one thing that uh, VMware and other companies have been doing more in the last couple of years thing is just compensating some of our leaders in these efforts. So for example, um, that could be with extra equity or we were talking about award systems, for example. I know, for example, one year we got, um, we have at your best awards. And so they basically translate into points. You can spend experiences. If you want to go to a trip to London or you want to get $3,000 worth of Bloomingdale gift cards, like I did one year, <laughs> <laughs> just whatever it is. So each year it kind of changes how they compensate for this extra work, but it's just something to be thoughtful of. I mean, many people are doing it because they're passionate about it, but it is extra work and it's usually uncompensated. Yeah, and I know we've talked about kind of another way of getting people to step up is who makes the invite is important, right? Like if the executive team is asking you, Christine, to, to be on the council, I think you're more likely to say yes. Yeah, absolutely. And all of this has been really helpful because we're at this stage in our journey where we have some transition happening on the council and in our employee affinity groups. And we're not getting as much engagement in like round two as we were in the first year, I think people are seeing that there is a lot of work involved and oftentimes they feel like that work is invisible and not rewarded. And so we're trying to figure out ways, like how can we reward people? How can we make sure they get the recognition? So I've taken so many notes already <laughs> just from what Danielle was sharing. Oh, nice. One thing I forgot about, too, is um, capturing and performance reviews, where it actually counts towards your promotions and your efforts that you've been doing. So that's another thing is that we've been promoting, making sure that managers are taking this into account when they're thinking about the salaries, bonuses, promotions, that that work counts. Yeah. And are we holding managers accountable, too? I know some of you have mentioned those types of programs where they've got actual goals and everything that they're, that they're judged against as well. 
Yeah, and it's it's also a way to get leadership experience. If you are um, not a leader at your company or at the law firm specifically, it is a way to showcase your leadership abilities in the D, at DEI committee um, so that people understand your leadership abilities and helps with abilities to be promoted. Yeah, that was our main way of kind of selling the role to people the first time around. And, you know, a lot of people have aspirations to be leaders, but they it may be a few years down the road before that might actually happen for them professionally. And so, you know, leading one of these groups gets you a lot of exposure to people in the business that you might not otherwise have exposure exposure to in your day-to-day. -day. And actually, I think the two former, well, they'll, they will soon be former co-chairs of our women's employee affinity group are recently promoted to the director level. So it's and a lot of that is the exposure and the senior leadership team who makes these decisions ultimately about promotion um, got to know them more right. in their role um, in this work. So, Yeah, and that's definitely a great incentive for other people mm -hmm. to see that there is a path to, you know, to success, maybe not just due to that, but as, right. as part of the overall package. Um, I'd love to open it up to questions if anybody from the audience has anything they'd like to contribute or ask about. Otherwise, I was always going to, um, I'd like to come out of these kinds of discussions. You know, it, it can seem like a big and overwhelming problem. There's lots of grim statistics out there. Um, and the, you know, these are great to have some ideas coming out of it. But, um, I know Lauren has always been a, a great advocate for doing something is better than nothing and not letting yourself get overwhelmed with kind of the, the scope of the problem. So hoping each of you could share, you know, a, a small win or a concrete action item that can kind of get the momentum going um, for your company or your law firm. Um, you want to get started? Kristen? Sure. So I, I have two things, one that's focused towards the law firms I work with and then one that's focused towards, the, you know, the people within Yeti. Um, you know, Yeti's still pretty small where I can be pretty proactive in terms of working with all the various project teams. So as we've hired and added all these new diverse people to our R&D teams and our design teams, um, in meetings, I, I make an effort to kind of amplify, you know, people that I, I can sense in the room are feeling uncomfortable sharing or they're feeling shy, you know, kind of like, you know, how you mentioned with that women's think tank mm -hmm. thing. So... Um, oftentimes they may share an idea and then they get kind of, no one really hears it. And then somebody kind of interrupts. I try to bring it back, you know, to that person because what they say is really important, but like no one, like in the dynamics of the room, they're getting drowned out. So, you know, fortunately I'm in a position where I can amplify that person's voice. And so I try to treat it like my duty to do so. So every meeting I'm in, I try to, to do that. Um, on, with my outside counsel and other outside vendors, I make it a point to always ask about origination credit, especially with law firms um, or vendors that have a long relationship with Yeti that preceded my time. Um, yeah, I had no idea, like how, who's getting credit for all this work? Um, is there opportunity for some other type of credit um, on a matter basis? Like I have a, I use one law firm for all of our IP work um, and a great relationship, but on a specific matter, I might not necessarily go to the relationship partner I might want to go to that senior associate that did an amazing job on a previous project, and I want to go to her directly. Um, how does she get credit for that? Um, and how does how do the how do the executive team how does the executive team at her firm become aware of that um, and recognize her for that? So I think it's important. You know, a lot of times, especially coming into a new in-house role, you may inherit a number of vendors and law firms, and you have no idea where your credit's going. It could be some partner that actually doesn't spend much time on your on your work at all and trying to, you know, insert some equity and inclusion into that process, I think is really easy um, for us as in-house lawyers to do. Great point. Lauren? I say go adopt a high school. Yes. Your, go in your area. Give them some competition. In, a, in an underrepresented neighborhood where there may not be either a mock trial team or a robotics team where there may not be parents who are lawyers or engineers. Um, it is not that much money. It is a wonderful time spent. Love it, Charmin. And if you are in ASD and want to contact, I've got one. Um, I guess I'll say two things. One is if you're in-house, push your outside counsel. Um, you know, I, I saw firsthand, or I was able to see firsthand that um, 
making that request made a difference um, in terms of you know diversity. Uh, if you're at law firm at a law firm, I recommend law firms look into your pipeline programs. We've been working a lot with our um, with our law firms to understand their pipeline for uh, especially in IP because it's it's difficult. Um, you can't just decide to go take the patent bar, right? So you, you have to start a lot sooner, as Lauren was talking about. Um, and some of our law firms have come up with some interesting novel ways to um, to build up their own pipeline and uh, just encourage people to think about that. Awesome. Danielle? I would say uh, be a sponsor. I was thinking about earlier when we were talking about how the statistics were um, people who are getting patents or you know, not as good for women or people from underrepresented communities. And I had the chance, I worked at a pharmaceutical company for just two years and I named an interim for patents. And I was thinking, you know, what <laughs> maybe helped me in that area? And really was, I think I had a great sponsor who was making sure I was working on some of the high visibility, high profile kind of uh, really novel projects right away. And so that put me in a place where he was championing, advocating for me to do that that I was able to work on some of those projects and get patents for them. So there you have it. You got some concrete action items. Um, hopefully you've all found this to be helpful. I've certainly enjoyed my time. So thank you all for coming this morning and thank you for paying attention. Thank you.